If the devil is responsible for sin and he spends all his time tempting us and he uses deceptions to get us to do things we wouldn't otherwise do, then why does God hold us accountable for our sins? In the final analysis, didn't the devil make me do it? So why should I have to answer on the day of judgment? It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. In the year 2000, the sports world was rocked by allegations that Hansi Kronje, the South African cricket captain, was involved in a match-fixing scandal in India. Kronje was adored by the South African public and commanded the respect of millions throughout the world for his brilliant cricket captaincy. For fans everywhere, he embodied the true spirit of the game as he led South Africa back to the international arena in the post-apartheid era. Kronje was born in September 1969 in Bloemfontein and was called up for the 1992 Cricket World Cup. He made his test debut shortly after against the West Indies. He captained South Africa from 1993 onwards with great success against the best in the world. He was a shrewd strategist and an inspirational leader. Hansi was viewed as a role model for the children of the Rainbow Nation of South Africa. He was considered a saint and was a self-described born-again Christian. So it came as a huge shock when on April 7, 2000, Delhi police said they had conclusive evidence of match-fixing involving Hansi Kronje and Sanjay Chawla, a representative of an illegal Indian betting syndicate. Kronje had accepted bribes from bookies to fix cricket matches. A case of cheating, fraud and criminal conspiracy was filed against Kronje. The public was in disbelief. Kronje's downfall was swift. Four days later, he was sacked as captain and was later banned from cricket for life. When confronted with the evidence, Kronje confessed that he'd been dishonest and blamed Satan for his errant behaviour, claiming, the devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. But was the devil really responsible for Kronje's dishonesty? Was Kronje responsible at all? Who was to blame? Recently, I was travelling home from work when my vehicle was struck from behind. What had happened was the vehicle in front of mine had stopped abruptly and I'd responded by slamming on the brakes just in time to avoid hitting the car in front of me. However, the vehicle behind me wasn't able to stop in time and hit the car behind me and pushed it into my vehicle. We all got out of our cars and surveyed the damage. And then the blame game began, as each of us blamed someone else for the accident. The human tendency to place the blame somewhere else is so strong that we do it instinctively, even when there's no possible defence for our behaviour. If we cheat in our income tax, it's because the government is mismanaging our money and the tax rate is too high anyway. And if we're rude to the shop assistant in the store, it's because they should know better than to answer the phone when there are people waiting at the counter. And giving them a verbal blast is actually doing them a favour because now they'll do a better job and one day work their way up the corporate ladder. You know, it seems that no matter what we do, there's always a good reason for it. And we skillfully avoid the possibility that we're actually to blame for something we've done. It's a common human trait that has an ancient tradition behind it. In fact, you'll find it happening way back in the Garden of Eden, right after God comes to deal with the fact that Adam and Eve have sinned. Listen carefully to what happens as God asks our first parents a few tough questions. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now pay attention carefully to the answer that Adam gives God. Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. 
Now, there's no question that Adam gave a pretty factual account of what happened. His wife really did give him forbidden fruit, but that's not the whole picture. Adam's response is a wholehearted attempt to place responsibility for his mistake on somebody else. And if you read it carefully, he's not just blaming his wife, he's also blaming God. Listen, Adam says, it's not my fault I ate it. It's that woman you gave me that made this happen. So there you have it, the very first instance of a human being trying to place blame on other people. And we've been doing it ever since. But let me ask you, what kind of a world would we have if people stopped blaming everybody else and just took responsibility for their actions? What would happen if we stopped trying to put a positive spin on absolutely everything we do to cover up our mistakes? You know, I came across a story the other day that did my heart a lot of good. Some of you may remember the brutal slaying of six people in New York City back in the mid-1970s. For a long time, nobody could figure out what was going on until an unpaid parking ticket put David Berkowitz at the scene of the crime and the son of Sam Killings finally came to an end. As the story unfolded, it was actually pretty horrific. David Berkowitz told authorities that he heard voices telling him to do it. And it came out during the investigation that he'd been involved in a satanic cult that urged him to commit the murders. When the courts finally convicted him, he was given enough consecutive life sentences to lock him up for at least 350 years. Now, a couple of years ago, David's name came up for parole, and of course, people became concerned that the parole board might actually let the son of Sam back out into the streets. What a lot of people didn't realize is that David had become a genuine Christian during his time in prison. When the time for his parole hearing came, he wrote a letter to Governor Pataki and said some pretty amazing things. Let me share just a couple of lines from that letter with you. Dear Governor Pataki, I'm writing to you with regards to my parole hearing, which is scheduled for June. Sir, I'm so very sorry for the pain, grief and suffering I've caused many innocent people by my criminal acts of some 25 years ago. I'm haunted by my actions, and I would do anything to undo this tragedy. I know that I have failed and disappointed my loving family, and I disgraced myself for the rest of my life. However, today, because of Jesus Christ and my faith in Him, I'm trying my best to make amends to society in any way that I can, and I'm thankful for whatever opportunities which may come my way to do this. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Big deal. Prison conversions happen all the time, and people try to use them to get early parole. But that's where this case is different. Listen to what David says just a few words later. I am disappointed that there is even going to be a parole hearing. I know that the sentencing laws require a hearing to be held in June, a date which was set 25 years ago. But the fact is, I have absolutely no interest in parole. I have done nothing whatsoever to try to obtain parole. For example, I've never asked anyone, be they friend or minister, to write a letter of support in my behalf. Likewise, I've never asked any prison officials to write letters to recommend me for release. I do not believe in doing such things. Frankly, I can give you no good reason why I should even be considered for parole. I can, however, give you many reasons why I should not be. The loss of six lives and the wounding of even more are reasons enough for the latter. In all honesty, I believe that I deserve to be in prison for the rest of my life. I have, with God's help, long ago come to terms with my situation and I have accepted my punishment. Now tell me that's not a breath of fresh air. Here's a man who can admit that he's done something wrong and he's not interested in trying to circumvent his punishment. He's willing to deal with the consequences and take the full blame, even though it's known that there were others who were involved in those crimes. 
And by contrast, most of us can't even admit it when we accidentally put a dent in someone's car in a parking lot. A while ago, as my daughter and I were leaving a shopping area, we saw a car pull into a spot. The driver opened her door to get out of her car, and as she did, she bumped the car next to her, damaging the door. She then looked around to see if there were any witnesses, and when she felt that no one had seen the incident, she hurriedly left the scene. Now the problem has become so big that a lot of the things we used to label bad behaviour have become diseases or disorders instead. Now I'm not a doctor and I certainly don't have a medical degree, but it seems to me that we are coming up with a medical or a psychological reason for just about everything we do. These days, if you're involved in something that causes problems in society, we label it as a genetic problem, which tells the whole world there's nothing you can do about your behavior because it's written into your DNA. If you're habitually doing something that's either harmful to yourself or the rest of society, we call it a disorder and we medicate you for it. And of course, the message we're sending out more and more is that it's not your fault. If your behavior stinks, it's because of something in your genetic makeup or it's because of the environment you grew up in. Now, I'm not saying your family history doesn't have something to do with how you turn out. The Bible clearly speaks about the effects of sin being passed on from one generation to the next. But that doesn't mean that you're forever doomed to live out a life that was programmed for you long before you were ever born. There really is something you can do about the problems in your life. And the first step to ridding yourself of the things that you'd like to be rid of is to simply own up to your own responsibility in the whole matter. Not everything you do is your parents' fault, or because of a strange disease, or because of an uncontrollable outside influence. Sometimes you just do wrong things, and there's no good reason for it. You know, we've taken the art of passing the buck to new heights in 21st century Australia and New Zealand. For example, when someone's caught cheating on his or her spouse in today's world, very few people will actually own up to what they've done. Even if they're caught red-handed, an alarming number of people will come up with some reason that their spouse drove them to adultery. And the message we're sending out is that nothing is actually our fault. But let's be honest about it. Nobody made you turn to adultery. Even if there are problems in your marriage, adultery is not your only option. You made a deliberate choice to cheat on your spouse. And the sooner you can admit it, the sooner you have a chance of putting things back together again and working on the real issues. Listen, we've become so hesitant to just own up to our own sinful natures that we're resorting to one of the oldest excuses in the book. When Adam and Eve were confronted by God, Adam tried to place the blame on both God and his wife. But take a close look at the way God responded to Adam's excuse. First of all, let's be clear that there is some truth in Adam's claim. His wife really was a negative influence, and she was the one who brought him the fruit. But in spite of that, God still holds Adam accountable. Listen to what he says in verse 17 of chapter 3. It is written, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Listen, says God, I know exactly what happened. I saw your wife bring you that fruit, and I heard the word she spoke to you, but that doesn't change the fact that you disobeyed a clear order, and I'm going to hold you accountable for it. Let's not kid ourselves. In the kingdom of heaven, there are no buck passes. In the books where God records the actions of men, the blame always falls exactly where it's supposed to fall. And believe me, it's much better to own up to your mistakes now than to wait until the moment when it's too late to do anything about it. Now, a moment ago, I said that the human race is resorting to one of the oldest excuses in the book. And you'll find it right here in Genesis chapter three. After God speaks to Adam, he turns to his wife and she tries to pass the buck to. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. You know what Eve's excuse was? 
The devil made me do it. And that, I'm afraid, is the oldest excuse in the book. Hansi Kronje didn't invent this saying. It dates back thousands of years before he illegally fixed cricket matches. And if you think about it, it's a pretty convincing argument, because the devil really is the one who started it all. Now, if he hadn't approached Eve in the garden, it's doubtful that she would have ever eaten from that tree. So to a large extent, Eve was telling the truth, but it wasn't the whole picture. Notice how God responds to her in verse 16. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Listen, Eve, he says, I know that the devil worked you over, and I know that you were deceived into doing something you weren't supposed to do. But the fact remains that you knew you weren't supposed to do it, and I'm still holding you accountable. You see, if there's one thing you can count on, it's that God works in a perfectly fair way every time. He didn't let Adam and Eve off the hook because they still had a choice when they were faced with temptation. Someone else had deceived them, but in their hearts they knew the difference between right and wrong, and so they were responsible for their actions. Let's take another look at the remarkable case of David Berkowitz. If anyone had the excuse that the devil made him do it, he did. Today he tells the chilling story of becoming involved in a satanic cult that took him down the path to becoming the son of Sam. His involvement in the occult became so strong that he actually started to hear demonic voices, and he gave up control over his mind to forces of darkness. In today's world, you might expect somebody like that to plead insanity or to tell the world that he had no control whatsoever over the situation. But since he found a meaningful relationship with Christ, he's willing to accept his share of the blame. He knows full well that he didn't have to make a pact with the devil. And that's the attitude we should take too. Of course there are a lot of circumstances in life that tempt us to do the wrong thing. Of course we're thrust into difficult situations from time to time. But in every circumstance, we still have the power of choice. The Bible says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God's promise is this, in every circumstance, no matter how difficult, you'll always have the option of doing the right thing. And that only serves to reinforce the idea that you really are responsible for the decisions you make. When you have the promise of God that He will help you make the right decision, what possible excuse could you have for making the wrong one? When it comes right down to it, there just is no good excuse for sin. And if there was such a thing as a good excuse for sin, I don't think it would be sin anymore. The truth is that most of us have become so accustomed to caving into temptation that we've made a habit out of it. We've buckled so many times that we've started to believe the lie that there's nothing we can do about it. But the Bible says you have a choice. And it's in the power of choice where we have the primary responsibility for the sins we commit. You see, the Bible says in plain language that the devil will pay for his role in deceiving you. In Ezekiel 28, it tells us that God is actually going to destroy him for all the heartache and the suffering that he's caused. Listen to this. Speaking to Satan, God says, By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you, and I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. In the Garden of Eden, God turned to the serpent and told him it was coming. One day he said, the Messiah is going to come and you will be destroyed. That's something you can be absolutely certain of. In the end, you don't have to worry about the devil's responsibility for your actions. You only have to worry about yours. I know it's become popular to suggest that for every wrong habit you have, there's a specific demon that's forcing you to do it. But it's time to stop passing the buck and accept responsibility for your actions. 
God will deal with the devil, but he wants to deal with you too. And the Bible says the moment that you accept responsibility, God suddenly becomes the ultimate buck passer. He takes all the responsibility for your sins on himself. This amazing arrangement is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, where it is written, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I hope you caught that. In the ultimate blame game, God takes all your sins and heaps them on himself. And then the Son of God carries them up a hill called Golgotha and he pays for them with his life. Maybe you've noticed that when Adam accused God of being part of the sin problem, God didn't say a word in his own defense, even though he was completely innocent. And when Jesus was dragged before human courts and told to defend himself, he didn't say a thing. Now, I've often assumed that Jesus was silent because he was determined to die for you. And that's absolutely true. But is it possible also that he didn't say a word because he was carrying our sins and there's not a single good excuse for any of them? A lot of you watching today are tired of living the way you do. You keep living life your own way, but it's not working. And the more you blame others, the more miserable you feel. All it takes is to come clean with God. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 that if you would just confess your sins to God, not making excuses for them, but actually admitting to them, He wipes them away completely. And that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. You can spend the rest of your life blaming everybody and everything for the way your life is, but you'll never enjoy the utter freedom that comes from admitting your sins to God. If you would only take ownership for your mistakes, then God would be willing to take responsibility for them Himself. So let me ask you, what's keeping you from starting your new life? You know, we really have a choice to make. We can spend our life passing blame on everybody else, but I've yet to meet somebody that found happiness that way. What works is to admit when we've done something wrong and come clean with God. That brings real peace and joy. Why don't we pray together? Father in heaven, we can admit today that we've made mistakes, that we are responsible for our own sins. But today we claim the promise you made in the Bible that if we confess our sins, you wipe them away completely. You forgive us and give us a new life in Jesus Christ. We want to claim that new life. We want that peace of mind and that clean, pure heart that you offer us through the gift of Jesus at the cross. Forgive us, we ask, and set us on a path where we are walking with Christ. We ask this in Jesus' precious name, amen.